Welcome to the Gaudium et Spes podcast. Every other week, we bring you Catholic teachings and stories of faith from people throughout the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. This is the Gaudium et Spes podcast. Hello and welcome everyone to the latest podcast episode of our Gaudium et Spes uh, series. Um, Be sure, if you haven't already, check out the last podcast we have with Bishop Walk, where he goes over the major and minor prophets of the Old Testament. Um, As you can see, we're on location uh, today. We are at uh, St. John Church in Panama City, and we have the pleasure of interviewing Matt and Casey Jenlin, and uh, who are parishioners at St. Dominic's Church. So Matt and Casey, welcome. It's great to have you guys here today. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Happy Exciting. to be here. Cool. Really good. good to be over on this side of the diocese. And uh, special shout out. Thank you again, St. John's, for hosting us on very late notice. So we're really happy to be here. Um, as always, guys, we'll start out with our kind of highs and lows game based on the first line of the Gaudium et Spes document, which goes, I'm going to check my notes here, the joys and the hopes, the fears and anxieties of the men of this age, uh, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted. These are the joys and hopes, the fears and anxieties of the followers of Christ. So I'm going to start with you, Casey. Highs, lows, joys and anxieties, griefs. What's going on lately? Uh, life has been very busy mm-hmm. and uh, trying to balance it all. I ask God to help schedule my day and all our activities. We have three kids and uh, we were just this past weekend for our son um, Jack's uh, soccer tournament. And we were very blessed. Uh, we went to a mass Saturday mm-hmm. evening afterwards at uh, Co Cathedral St. Thomas More, and got to witness confirmation. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah Bishop Walker. Walker. Mm-hmm. Yes, so in was... the beautifully renovated, redesigned. Mm-hmm. Had, you, had you guys been we there didn't, before? Didn't see it no, before, so, so I didn't. I know. Know. Yeah. <laughs> it is beautiful. It was gorgeous. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it was a nice surprise. Yeah, it's really cool. Matt, just what's going well, on? Yeah, with you? It, it's as with most parents of you know, middling kids, uh, the, uh, <laughs> busy, busy, busy. And it was wonderful to go see, you know, our, uh, our son play soccer and go out there with teams and that kind of thing and get a little time together. And then, uh, you know, never stops going. They're leaving for Reno on Tuesday. So now we got to get them packed up. She's going to go with, uh, two of the, two of the children to Reno. So that's a little stress and good anxiety, I guess, for some excitement for them coming up. So just, it never stops. Okay. It's like a showcase. Something like that, or is it like a showcase tournament, or something like that. Or oh, um, oh. It, was a, it was a big tournament yeah. in Florida State. Yeah, the fields over there. I mean, I don't know. Do- We're new to of- soccer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> they just tell us. I where thought to you go meant in Reno, we- Tahoe. Oh, like, no, no, We're no, just no. going to see this now. My parents. <laughs> <laughs> no standard middle of the weekend tournament, but it's kind of nice to be. It gets you uh, gets you out of the house and get some one on one time with one child and. Cool. You know, kids love to stay in hotels and eat out, so it mm-hmm. it's, brings you some joy. That's cool. Suzanne? Yeah, so coming off of uh, spring break here, mm-hmm. um, my daughter and I went on a short little trip. Uh, had to go down and see our uh, Gators uh, play softball at the University of Florida. Go Gators, you know. Never ending. Um, yeah, it's Chez is now. FSU and I'm <laughs> UF. And so there's this great rivalry that we had. And yeah. I haven't talked about it in a while, no, so good. I no, thought just I just wanted to bring going. it up today. So, <laughs> yeah, but we had a really good time. Some good um, mommy-daughter bonding. That's cool. So, yes. And how about yourself? Oh, man, this weekend, past weekend, we had um, – Sacred Heart Cathedral School over in Pensacola, we had our annual fundraiser, which has become slightly legendary. It's called Trivia Night. Um, (laughs) And it's not your normal trivia night. It's like basically a costume Mardi Gras party with some trivia attached to it. Um, It's so fun. It's just, it's a, the first time I went, I was like, is this a church fundraiser? Why is everyone dressed weird? Why are people throwing (laughs) jello shots around around the room and stuff like that? But once you kind of ease in a little, it's like kind of like a big wedding party. Um, with some costumes and some weird skits. And uh, Father James Valenzuela this year was dressed as uh, Tiger Woods. Um, <laughs> and there was a table of Georges and Father Jacob Jacks, who's our parochial vicar. He was George Lucas, the director of Star Wars. Um, so just weird, fun stuff. My table was a millennial table. We were celebrating our, I don't know if you guys are, you guys are millennials right now. Mm-hmm. Gen Xers. Gen X, yeah. I guess. Do you guys look down on us? 
Uh, <laughs> you can that, say it. Not, not that you know about. <laughs> <laughs> so we were basically poking fun at ourselves all of us there. I was a millennial hipster bartender. My wife was avocado toast. We had um, <laughs> we had a snowflake. <laughs> and a guy dressed in bubble wrap that said, fragile, please handle with care. Oh, okay. um, a Bitcoin miner. You could stop me anytime. But we seriously had a great time. Yeah, so. I, didn't, I heard nothing about trivia. Yeah. 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 Yes. We did. <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> the trivia is intense. And people do care. And people stack their team stuff. We finished like 15th out of 34, though. So it was a fun night. Good. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, Matt Casey, we um, we met each other. You guys have honestly met today, Suzanne and you guys. So getting acclimated. So we met each other in 2019 on the Diocesan Marriage Tree. Uh, and you guys came back again in 2021. Got to have a little bit of a conversation wrap up time where you just shared your testimony and your witness, um, which was really, really, really compelling and, and interesting and definitely unique aspect of Christ entering in your lives. So um, and you also gave a recent witness on the St. Dominic uh, rescued retreat, I believe mm-hmm. that was, mm-hmm. which was again. If you have not seen it, check out Saint Dominic's YouTube page, and they have the whole retreat on there. Um, but you've got a lot of their story here. So yeah, we're we're here to kind of hear the story of your marriage, your faith life, um, and how God has entered in your life in, in unique ways. But we always start at the beginning. We're, have you always been Catholic? Your kind of faith upbringing, where'd you come mm-hmm. from, and stuff. And yeah, take us through it. Mm-hmm. Do you want to start? Or me? Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess for both of us, we, we're cradle Catholics. So I'm from uh, a small town in Minnesota, uh, out in the farm country. So uh, if you haven't met Minnesotans, we're kind of stoic. So the the church was uh, the church was kind of a um, an old fashioned. Um, just imagine a church out in the country with a bunch of farmers, and it was it was wonderful. Uh, we had a great my, my whole family. Um, my dad had a pretty large family, so we um, were brought up in the church. Um, mass all the time uh, i remember you know any time even we go up vacations up north somehow my dad knew where the church was and knew when the mass was before the internet before you got masstimes.org but uh so i it was a wonderful wonderful introduction to the church but as a child you, you know it was kind of sort of surface level but okay. but the right the right thing and and the and the catholic grade school is i think was just a wonderful experience for me and you know being religion and religious classes throughout the day and and learning a lot more about the church and i Looking back now, it was even more wonderful than it was then. It's like German Catholic territory. Well, in Minnesota, the question, you know, you, 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 pretty much the question is, are you Catholic or are you Lutheran? Are you, <laughs> are you German or are you Irish? That's, just picture that. That's, that's the kind of environment it was okay, like. Gotcha. Yeah. Casey? Uh, cradle Catholic. And both my parents are from Dubuque, Iowa, but we were raised in uh, mostly San Jose, California, mm-hmm. and also uh, Lake Tahoe as a kid. And so that was fun and interesting. And spent one year in Minnesota, actually, freshman mm-hmm. year in high school, and then back to the same house wow. in San Jose. My dad was in sales and <laughs> found different jobs, adventures, I guess, and, mm-hmm. uh, and it did instill a sense of adventure for all of us kids. My parents did. Um, but we were cradle Catholics, and my mom, I guess, also went to – she was a stay-at-home mom. I remember vaguely going to some daily masses with her as well and uh, went to public schools until high school. Very blessed to go to uh, Archbishop Mitty in San Jose. And I was so thankful because growing up was hard uh, with those moves. I was very shy. I did not know how to speak to anyone. And I'm number four of five kids. I mean, always had someone to play with and mm. and my best friend lived next door. So I didn't really have to learn how to talk much. I was the perfect student, very quiet in class. And I'm so thankful for Mitty though, because they had uh, retreats for each grade year. And so we had moved back uh, to my sophomore year in high school to San Jose. And that's really what started to bring me out of my shy shell is the retreats they had and where we we go and have these overnight weekend retreats, and you really find out in your small groups and in the larger groups that, you know, we all have the same fears and hopes, and you, you just get to the real nitty-gritty of life and things that we're struggling through together, and it's a really close-knit um, group at our high school, and uh, my friend and I really joke, a friend from high school and I joke about still that we left Mitty and then found out people are mean out there (laughs) that we just didn't know. But, you know, again, life lessons to learn. So, and I went to um, 
community college first, and then uh, St. Mary's College in Moraga, so Catholic school, and mm-hmm. and uh, which I actually, that's part of my story is where I drifted a bit in my faith. Even though I was going to this wonderful Catholic school, mm-hmm. I think it was because I was Catholic all my life, went to Mass all the time, and even though I prayed every day, and I was spiritual, you might call it, um, and had prayer and meditation classes. I don't know why I wasn't participating in the sacraments. It was just part of my drifting and coming back. What brought me back actually was mono. I had my last year in college, and I pray. I was in so much pain that I would pray and meditate until I fell asleep and rested. Hmm. Uh-huh. And that really brought me back into um, my faith, a stronger faith. Hmm. Interesting. Very good. Well, Minnesota, mm-hmm. California, not exactly the same neck of the woods. Yeah. Um, how'd you guys meet? Where it happened? We had to go to Texas to meet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we had to make it happen. Yeah. So I was, uh, um, so I'm an Air Force, a retired Air Force officer. So I've been around. So after college, I went, I went to college. I also went to a Catholic college, St. Thomas in, in, in uh, St. Paul and the University of Minnesota. Uh, so I had, uh, uh, been selected to, f- to fly airplanes as a navigator or weapon systems officer, as it turned out. So uh, I started my Air Force career going to Pensacola, as we talked about a little bit there. Got training over there. Um, and then through some hardships, like we had talked about off air, the uh, I got selected to be to fly the B-1 bomber, which meant I had to go to electronic warfare school, which happened to be in San Antonio at a place called Randolph Air Force Base. So I was temporarily only I was only at Randolph for about three months in San Antonio. And, uh, and then her, she tells the story better after that, but that's, just, this is, that's where our paths crossed for the first time. So I'm trying to remember the exact years. It's been so long. So our story starts before that, when I was actually in the prayer meditation class at St. Mary's, mm-hmm. I have was preparing for a speech and I thought, well, I'm going to meditate before, uh, to help relax and before the speech. And my mother had taught me the Holy Spirit mantra, just a simple prayer. And so about 10 minutes after just doing Holy, come Holy Spirit, all of a sudden this phrase entered my mind, fruitful of the mouth. Okay. That did not come from me. I would not think of that. Okay. (laughs) And I come Holy Spirit. And the next phrase was marriage with God. I went, I have no idea what that means. Possibly none. I'm not sure, but I have to go give my speech. I'll catch you later, Lord. <laughs> so it was a week later that we, in prayer meditation class itself, that um, Brother Camilla said, okay, we're going to have a, a deep prayer uh, meditation today, three levels down, and you're going to meet someone. So I opened up, you know, went down, you always open a door and enter the, the space, and I, I walked out into gravel and looked up in this little country church, and I started walking up to it, and this being, dazzling white and this orb, couldn't see a face, comes around the corner and gets Link's arms with me and the doors open. And there's red carpet going down the aisle and dark pews. And I grew up in California. You don't have traditional churches, you know. Um, so I'd never seen something like that. That was very different for me. And the organ music's playing and we're going down the aisle. And I realize this is Jesus leading me down the aisle. Mm. And get to the end and then another he leaves and another being, I can't see the face, comes up, and then we start going up the steps of the altar. God comes out, like, the, you couldn't see the face, just the beard that used to think, you know, and the staff. <laughs> and, and right when we get this, the music stopped when we got to the top of the altar, and Brother Camille said, you know, the par- the meditation is coming to an end. Think, you know, think the person, or he said the being. It's for um, appearing to you, and I just turned and looked at his face and said, I got to go, and I'll catch you later. <laughs> and gave him a kiss on the cheek and ran out. So that was 98, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was 98. So I had never had an experience like that before. I asked Brother Camillus about it, and he said, God's just opening up. He's showing his light, your path, Mm. revealing it to you. He said, your marriage is going to be blessed by God. So, okay. I had never had a boyfriend. I was so picky and independent, you know. (laughs) Dated a little bit, but, you know, had never really connected with anyone. And we had guys and girls. We're just a group of friends. And we just hung out. So, I, okay, sounds good. And so when um, the opportunity came up to visit my brother, who was in the Air Force at the time, um, a couple, it was 
1999, October mm-hmm. 1999, mm-hmm. flew out. He said, we'll just go to somewhere on base in San Antonio. So there were three different bases at the time because um, I'd already been to Del Rio twice mm-hmm. and there's really not much to where visit he was there stationed. where he was stationed with his family. Ooh, now it's coming together. So he happened to pick the base map had been at for a short time because okay. he had been at Pensacola. And so uh, one evening his wife said, you know, why don't you guys go down to the old club and, you know, have a beer and hang out just the two of you. And Ted said, yeah, I usually run to other pilots. I know let's go. And as we're leaving, Christy, my sister-in-law, said, you're going to meet somebody. I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to some fly boy. <laughs> and I did happen to meet him. So it, it was um, pretty funny uh, that uh, it took me by surprise. It was just, oh, I forgot to mention, it was the week prior to going. My oldest brother, Tim, had told me, you know, Case, you can come off standoffish. You need to act more interested if you're interested. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, well, thank you for that gift. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, and I had actually been to a concert with some friends just the week prior, and I was feeling lonely, and I remember praying, I was by myself, <laughs> my sweet golden retriever, and I prayed to God. I said, God, I am tired of these stupid crushes. If you have someone in mind for me, that's great. But if you don't, that's great, too, because all I need is you. It was a week before. A week before. Mm-hmm. And then I, but then I went, as a caveat, I went, but Lord, if there is someone in mind for me, will you please help us know right away? Because I'm st- I'm tired of stupid crushes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if we can recognize each other right away. So we did. We did. It was Aww. love at first sight. Actually, I mean, we <laughs> we <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, we were, I was with my my one friend because we as, as we had spoken about earlier, we couldn't get a ride off the base, so we <laughs> we, and we had no car, so we just we went to the officers' club just to just to hang out. Why not? And yeah, so this beautiful blonde girl with beautiful blue eyes is sitting there with her boyfriend, which <laughs> my older so, brother. <laughs> so her her brother's like six years older than you, or not? Eight. Oh, he's eight. Okay. He's eight years yeah. old. Um, but same age generally. But she kept she was smiling at me because her other brother told my her to, brother to said, show that you're interesting. <laughs> so I said, well, "Why is she smiling at me when she's with her boyfriend?" I don't. Want <laughs> so I even told my brother that I said, "Oh, there's a cute guy." I said. What do you want me to do? I said, you're just one of the girls tonight. He goes, okay. I'm like, I just have to tell you, there's this cute guy. Mm-hmm. And and so I um, actually, Ted was finishing his beer, and I thought, oh, they're going to walk away. And because the whole bar is open, they were standing at the very end, I, and I just took my last sip of beer, and I said, I'll go get us some beers. And I went up to the bar, and I stood right next to him so he could say hello. And it was silent, of course. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't, I ordered my beers, got my beers and paid. I'm like, oh, he's not going to say anything. I, and I said, okay. So I go to leave and I feel some feel this in my arm. I'm like, who's the 12-year-old that poked me in the arm? <laughs> and I turn around. And it was me. <laughs> his friend had reached over him and poked him in the arm. And and they were both, they didn't say anything. Though. They just sat like this. Like just, uh, it was hilarious. I'm not said. smooth at all. <laughs> <laughs> so Certainly not smooth. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not one to be uh to be forward or anything so it was, <laughs> thankfully that's why you have to hang around with friends that are more outgoing so that we'll poke pretty girls in the arm so oh my gosh. anyway that's wow. there's many many stories to go along with that but that was uh we we started talking and we didn't stop talking uh the whole weekend and the for years after that well that night he asked me twice to marry him <gasps> wow i am I may have. Oh my. Very smooth, man. Well, it was it's like, <laughs> like rule I said. number one in playbook of dating. Don't ask girl to marry you yeah. the first day you meet each other. And I asked if she was Catholic first, too, because I was like, I'm not going to waste my time. For some reason, <laughs> no. I had always kind of, I'd come to the to the realization, I, I, again, back to the seeds maybe that were planted, that I understood that a, a marriage in the, in the church was, was important to me. I didn't quite understand... Uh, maybe I didn't understand the ins and the outs and the whys, but, for, but it was clear to me that that was important. In fact, you know, not even a year prior, uh, I had met a very wonderful, uh, uh, fun girl who was Baptist and, and, uh, she had just, she actually said to me, would you change your, would you change your religion for a girl? And I, without thinking, just said, nope. And I'm, and I didn't, like I said, I didn't think about it, but it was so buried inside me that I'm like, I, I really want to find someone who shares, shares my faith with me. And, uh, and I found her. So. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. Mm. Yeah. So fast forward 10, 15 years, three kids, 
perfect marriage, oh, yeah. perfect life, yep. you know, just like, you know, everything in a romance novel, mm-hmm. book, story, movie. Yes, no. Yeah, well, I didn't, we, we don't even have to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. we, got it. we nailed it. What, Absolutely. What else is there to talk about? Yeah. No, yeah. tell us really, uh, tell us about your faith journey cool. and kind of where you're at today and... Well, we were talking, we discussed it a little bit last night without having to go into a, a lot of details, but being in the Air Force, we moved around a lot, and we always found every every station we were at, Rapid City, South Dakota, Abilene, Texas, Yorktown, Virginia, Montgomery, Alabama, um, there was always a church home there, and it was wonderful. So we, uh, we grew very, uh, I think, slowly but steadily in our faith. Um, uh, you know, it was always, we always had, it just felt like home wherever we went. We were blessed with a little bit more, uh, the churches that we were at were generally kind of active and, um, we're able to join up in certain little groups and that kind of thing and get to know people. We, we wanted to be, uh, as you know, when you move, you, you want to get involved with the community right yes. away. You, generally we're only in places for two to four years. So, uh, you got to dive right in and try to try to learn a little bit. So, um, I guess as our, we, we just kind of, we, we made slow progress, I guess. Um, uh, how would you describe it? As our faith journey? Uh, At least in our younger. In our younger years. I mean, we going to Mass, I can see how Catholics can get a bad rap, how you can get into the routine of things. Mm-hmm. And it is important to be part of, uh, I would join a women's group, or we did a Bible study, mm-hmm. a couple Bible studies in uh, Yorktown that were absolutely wonderful. Uh, and even even some marriage retreats was mm-hmm. really fun. Um, the problem is if you, those things you learn, if you're not applying them to your mm-hmm. life and to your marriage, you're really not growing. Mm-hmm. And life can get stagnant and all of a sudden years go by and you're not that close you mm-hmm. kind of have your own lives but i mean you get busy even too with kids sometimes it's just the routine of taking care of the kids getting them to their thing and you know some things that we are not let we might have for ourselves like i did tennis wherever i went i went and wanted to do tennis it was so easy to make fast friends and, and have a good time and i have to give a plug for your parents it was so sweet they said from the beginning you need to have a weekly date um and and we honestly didn't do that. And that's something that you can see in their life that that is they've made a priority and you can see that in their marriage, how that's, you know, had, you know, good fruits, mm-hmm. you know, bear, born in their marriage in that way. So I think we can. I'm grateful for the sacraments because they feed you and bring you graces when you start to drift mm-hmm. and but even, you know through the good times and bad. I mean, the church has been, the Catholic faith has just been such a gift and blessing in our lives and in our families and, and as a couple. Yeah. Well, so, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, um, when did you first like recognize that you were drifting? Um, I think oftentimes in life, we just kind of go through it and um, we don't realize that we're drifting further and further away from the things that we mean the most to us that we value that we we want to keep as a priority in our lives so so when was it for both of you was it at different times was it at the same time different times mm-hmm. different times yeah um so um do you want to start or you want to or? i'd say 2007 for me we were made in 2000 mm-hmm. and I just realized, you know, trying to talk to him, I just realized we were just completely far apart. And, and it was really in 2008 that came to a head Christmas, 2008. And of honestly, I hadn't seen it prior. It was Matt's, um, binge drinking. And, uh, it kind of came to a head at Christmas at his parents and I realized I was really angry and tired of it. That was Christmas, 2008, but 2007, I I didn't notice that we just didn't, it's all about the kids and our routine, sadly. And then in 
2008, it really came to a head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's uh, I I kind of take kind of a I don't know I guess a comfort in just plodding along, plugging ahead, worrying about worrying about other things and not really and hiding um, hiding perhaps things that are more important like a marriage. So it's Minnesota, much more comfortable. Minnesota farmer stoicism. Yes, right there. I, if you don't talk about a problem, it doesn't exist. I don't know. If you, <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but. Uh, yeah, so I'd rather avoid a problem by uh, working extra hard or doing um, uh, just completing more tasks or something rather than and just hiding from things. So it, so yeah, we she I'm sure she re- realized uh, drifting apart way more than I did. So uh, yeah, it was evidence, and, and really, um, I was pretty good. I still am uh, pretty good at uh, at isolating. I like to just uh, not worry about things. Uh, and, and kind of isolate myself and not see problems. So yeah, so I I um, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I've been dry f- sober for th- well over three years now. Um, but you know, I'll save you some of the gorier details. But just in case any of listeners maybe could can probably relate to what I'm what I can describe. You know, I didn't um, I wasn't the crazy over the top college partying guy. In fact, in college, I was probably one of the most temperate, uh, real easy, um, non-troublemaking guys as far as uh, drinking goes. But over time, it kind of, it just slowly got worse and worse and worse. So, um, you know, in your younger days, and it, it didn't help being in the military. And, and that lifestyle is a little, uh, kind of encourages that. It's the culture it's to the a cul- large extent. Yes, yeah. if we would fly a lot and we would drink a lot mm-hmm. and... Um, and it was kind of, kind of excused, Mm -hmm. but it got, you know, thankfully, thankfully in my younger days, I flew a lot and had to, had to wake up early. So it kind of kept things a little tempered, but I would slip up, slip up and overdo it occasionally. But then as time went on, slip occasionally got a little more and more often and more and more often. And and my friends that when we were lieutenants and, and drank beer all weekends grew up, I just chose not to grow up. So, um, it was re really insidious really insidious of just drinking a little bit more often and then flying less so well now i can uh it, i kind of maybe some people have it and i know i had it in my head if if, if it's a weekend or if it's something i don't have anything to do tomorrow i can have a couple of beers tonight right well then fast forward 10 years well i t- tomorrow's not that important i could probably drink during the week too so it just kind of built and built and built and the and the mistakes and the overdoing it got a little bit more often and by at some point it was just too, it was too late and it was just like, I, I am not in control of my life anymore. Um, and I had to come to that realization. And the, and to the outward effect of that on other people, like I said, was it's really was isolation. Like, I want to be by myself. You know, thankfully, I was not violent. I was not crazy. I never got in trouble with the law. I never lost a job. I never lost a security clearance. But that's not. But it probably maybe it would have been better if I did. Because, right. you know, maybe it would have been a wake up. But. But to the outside, mm-hmm. as kind of you mentioned, it's all rainbows and unicorns. Mm-hmm. In church, we look like a beautiful couple in church. I mean, sure. we got three three beautiful kids, and uh, what a perfect life, right? But you just you just don't know. It was um, nothing that someone from the outside could see. So, um, so something had to be done. I didn't recognize it early enough, but uh, eventually, you know what? We were talking a little bit about the hurricane. Mm-hmm. And, when Hurricane Michael came through here in 2018, devastated everything. And what it did for me was it actually ended up being a blessing because what happened, the hurricane wiped off, wiped out the town, took out the base. The base says, we're closed. Go somewhere else. You're going to get paid. You're not going to have to work for months. Mm-hmm. And so imagine, like I said earlier, if I got nothing to do, right? you know, living the rock star lifestyle, getting paid, living in hotels. So... Uh, it ended up being a blessing to kind of put me over the top and realize, holy, you, you need to, this is, this is unsustainable. So, uh, that is when I finally surrendered, surrendered to the Lord, because my whole life up to that point, I would pray in church and say, Lord, I'm drinking too much. Can you, can you fix me? Can you just kind of throttle back a little bit? Can you help me out? Mm. But I wasn't really praying. I wasn't really surrendering. I wasn't really um, in it, but. And I didn't know he was like this. I mean, he hit all this. It was all in my head. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, his drinking was more, it looked more like everybody else, like on the mm-hmm. weekends. It was so controlled. And, I, and we weren't praying together. I had no idea he had these struggles. Mm-hmm. I just knew that we were distant mm-hmm. and didn't just have this surface relationship, nothing mm-hmm. Because really? I was isolating. I don't don't tell me what to do, um, and I got it. I'm okay. Uh, I'll survive. So, uh, I mean, I didn't nag him or anything. I mean, he just nope. was by himself. I'm mm-hmm. just I have by my myself, own thing. To really go. lonely. So, um, anyway, after the the hurricane was uh, made it obvious that I was not in control of my life, uh, we uh, made a decision pretty quick um, that I got to do something. And then the final straw. Honestly, she set up. I went and talked to Father Michael Nixon at St. Dominic's, and uh, we talked for two hours. He gave me th- he gave me like two hours of his time after mass, mostly listened, and he find he just I remember that perhaps the best advice had been given by a priest in a long time. He just said, "Sounds like you know what you got to do." And I said, <laughs> "Yep, <laughs> Father, yep." So uh, uh, I can't I can't thank him enough for that that little nugget. And I just said, "I'm done." I surrender. I went to. I, I went off to rehab for a, a month, just like uh, up, went up to Alabama for twenty eight days, and um, I had just before that mass that that Saturday evening, I had just started looking into hmm. rehabs, and mm-hmm. it was yeah. And, she found it, and so when he mentioned it that morning, I said yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm actually we're actually looking at because he said don't wait until tomorrow. This is Sunday after mass. He said don't wait until tomorrow because you'll talk yourselves out of it. Mm-hmm. He yeah. said go make arrangements now. So. And that and that really that act of surrender changed everything because I realized uh, it's, I'm not in control. I'm not I'm not in control of my life. The Lord is, um, and it was from that point on. I, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's kind of easy once you let God run the show. Mm-hmm. And it was it was. Was it Epiphany Sunday? Okay. Yes. I was not paying that much attention at the time. <laughs> That's what I thought it was. Well, we remember we realized that right before. We didn't realize so like a year and a half later that it was Epiphany Sunday that you had, had your sure. Epiphany. Sure. I went up there on January 8th or January 7th. Okay. Um, yeah. And from that point on, you know, uh, went to a, a rehab center which uh, and got deeply involved in the 12 steps, which is uh, it's it's. Um, it's not. It's sort of faith based. It's non denominational, but it, it's all about God. It's all about surrendering to God. So, within a couple of days of being away and and just clearing my head, I had the spiritual awakening feeling uh, incident where it was just um, at some point it just I got this feeling of this comfort that I've never felt before. Of mm. it's going to be okay, and that's kind of and it was like. Because when but most people would say you're not gonna you're not gonna drink it for forever for the rest of your life like that's how could you do that like and that's certainly what I thought too and I was like how am I, what this is I'm gonna change my whole life here what and then I just got this feeling it's gonna be okay and it was this comfort it was it was God just saying I got you thanks for you know thanks for coming back and, yeah. and uh, uh, um, I, I will take care of you and that's and that's really the the root of all the twelve steps is you I pray to God every morning. Um, Say thanks for keeping me sober yesterday. Keep me sober today. Uh, let me do your will today. Let me let me let me have the Holy Spirit work through me and help other people today. And that's worked so far. Wow. Pretty simple. So, yeah. It's simple. I, yeah. Just a pause here. So mm-hmm. your life hadn't fallen apart, Mm-mm. Casey. You were never like I'm 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 out tomorrow. Well, no. Uh, or got a little she, close. To that. Uh-huh. Okay. She probably deserved it. I deserved it. She, yeah. she should. She could have. But most people. So this is the kind of the crux of the whole thing. This mm-hmm. idea of surrender, right? Mm-hmm. Most people are like, "Look, I'm a high level pilot. I don't have any DUIs. I'm keeping it together. There's a lot of people worse off than me. Mm-hmm. People look at us, and we have a certain sense of they're great, they're mm-hmm. fine. And a lot of people are like, "I'm not surrendering. I'm mm-hmm. not going to blow up my life or go off to like. I'm not going to be that person that went off to mm-hmm. to get help or something like that." And so. 99% of people are just like not surrendering, never mm-hmm. going to do it, never going to let the graces happen or something like that with good reason with, with like when there's a measure mm-hmm. of risk there and stuff. Mm-hmm. And you kind of like have taken that step mm-hmm. and seen healing come as a result. Yeah. And not just in 28 days or not just in it. Mm-hmm. So maybe you guys can talk more into sort of so that was 20, 2019, January, 2019, 2019. Yeah. So how has the Lord continued to be faithful in the midst of this whole thing? And 
and bring healing. I've been talking for a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really started January 2018 for me mm. where I really had to lean on God because I, I was really done. I was mm. really done. Um, there was a point where I felt like a light switch just was clicked off. Like I will be the spouse because this is my duty right now and take care of the kids. But I don't know what you want me to do, Lord. And he, I leaned on a family member uh, at first and who, who's uh, an alcoholic in recovery. I'm so, so very thankful for him. And I got rid of the alcohol by in the house by June or July. And I think that was really a factor because then he, he really started to hide it and, and even more. And I think from the outside in, you can tell me differently, but I think that might have helped you realize, okay, if I'm hiding this, mm -hmm. then there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so it was the hurricane that really, that really just exposed uh, the reality, open things up. Right. And now at that point I was like, I don't care if anybody sees, maybe that'll help him. And like, mm -hmm. you know, you hear people having to have a rock bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, it's, it's the way things happen, the way it is, it's God's plan. I just trust that for each of us, that's just how it happened. That was part of our journey. And for me, I would step out. If, if I were to tell him how he should run his life, you know, in that way, that's me stepping out of humility. Mm -hmm. If you find it, if I found myself saying you should or shouldn't do it, that's, that's a key that you should not be doing that. <laughs> Don't use those words. Cause I could be stepping in and in the way of God yeah, yeah. and stepping out of humility. And, and that's something, honestly, the, the sacraments are so wonderful. That's something I found, of course, the Eucharist and the mass, um, feeling, you know, giving the graces and to keep going and so forth. And, but confession is so healing and wonderful and things that have come up. I mean, quite honestly, in confession for me is that I had an, an ego thing where I am right. I'm right that you drink too much or, or this isn't going the right way. And I've learned that expectations are simply resentments waiting to happen. You know, I had expectations about marriage mm -hmm. and, and uh, I had to let go of that mm -hmm. and find my own joy within God. And part of that was confessing that, that ego, that, that pride that I know better because it's just, I'm like, but I'm right. And it's like, and the reality it is, no one cares if you're right. No one cares. Yeah. And, it's it's and there's the craziest this, thing in marriage. Yeah, no yeah. one cares. And there's a th <laughs> there's a phrase that do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And that took me so many years to really <laughs> absorb that because I'm like, well, I'm right. I'm like, what is it? I'm like, oh, do I want to let just let it go and be peaceful and happy that way? Okay, that's what I had to learn. I had to confess that pride and also patience. That's been a big thing for me. Um, that, that, that's one thing I've noticed as well in sobriety is the uh, confession is much is more important and more meaningful because uh because of the ability to be open with myself uh and really accept the graces that because i have i have something I've, as we've kind of talked about there's a few little nuggets here and there for our lives that you can see you can say god was working god but the, i have a concrete uh i have a concrete reality of god helping me and taking care of me so it, it allows me to be even more <clears throat> open for the graces that come from confession and the mm -hmm. sacraments. And it's, um, it's just, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I'm telling you, your story is truly moving and I thank you for your honesty, for your vulnerability that you've mm -hmm. placed out here today. And, um, so last question, I just want to ask both of you, um, for all of those who are out there listening and watching today, is there any piece of advice you would give others that may be going through something similar to what you've went through or are going through right now in that recovery process? What can you piece of advice or nugget or something? Well, I don't know. I don't know if this would translate into practical uh, not advice, but. The key, I think the biggest thing that people can understand is you're, um, this sounds dumb, but you're not special. <laughs> We're all 
the same, especially if you're if you're any kind of an addict, <laughs> no matter what the substance or person or behavior or what it is, uh, you're not special. There's millions and millions of other people that are probably in the same boat as you, and perhaps the best thing you can do is uh, is understand that and talk to other people that mm-hmm. are in that boat because mm-hmm. there's a lot of them, mm-hmm. and um, you know there's uh, any no- number of you know programs but there <clears throat> there's help available in the formal sense but in the in the philosophical sense just realize you're not alone and you're not uh uh you're not as unique as don't let don't believe that you're so unique that you cannot be helped mm. perfect All right there're different specific situations however I mean, the same lessons are there to be learned mm. uh with Christ, if you open up your mind and your heart and mm-hmm. allow him and surrender to him, allow him, you let go and let God. And I know that's so hard. I mean, we tend to take things back too, but just keep giving it back to him. But I think something to look for is when someone's isolating, whether it's yourself. I mean, I like isolated too. I didn't want to burden my friends with what I was going on. And mm-hmm. I didn't want to talk disparagingly about my husband or uh, you know, there are, there are places. That's why there's there's there are twelve step programs for the friends and family as well, because everybody needs support. Uh, but I think the the thing is too shame. I think so many mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. hide in shame, and it's once you go inward like that, when you stay in your head, you're dead. I mean, you just have to reach out if you find yourself, you know, just isolated. It's so important just to get out and, and talk to somebody. Um, That's a, the clergy have been very helpful, you know, the religious yeah. and just that, that's a good tremendous. point. I think I've heard discussed from priests before. I think it was in church. Um, <clears throat> the difference between guilt and shame is, is there's a radically different thing, right? The guilt is you did something wrong and that's, and that's, you know, own up to it and, and take responsibility for it. But shame means you're a bad person because mm-hmm. you did something wrong. And it, that's, that's radically different. And don't let the shame uh, under, accept the guilt and under, understand it, but don't don't let that shame you into thinking you're less than a, a full person, human being, mm. and worthy of God's graces. Well, I like as, as Suzanne said, it, this is like a gift of a conversation, yes. and like I mean, I'm sh- not every family is struggling with like heavy issues to this degree and stuff like that, but every I think every Catholic at some point in time is like. I don't know, I really want to go there. Do I really want to like deal with that? Do I really want to deal with the lack of intimacy in our marriage? Do I really want to deal with like that conversation with a family member that I know is going to be awful and lead to, you know, mm-hmm. heartache and stuff like that. And your witness is as God was faithful to you beforehand. And he, like you get to a place of you let him take over, you know, mm-hmm. a place of surrender. He doesn't let people down. He doesn't mm-hmm. like, Oh, have fun crashing and burning. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like there's levels of intimacy and healing and, and a depth of prayer that can happen that is yeah. mm-hmm. that is not just for the select few, you know, um, and the sacraments can become more meaningful and your life as Catholics can be more meaningful. So, um, yeah, thank you guys. Mm-hmm. That was yeah, really, really so amazing. Yeah, um, it really was. If you're interested in diving deeper into your marriage, um, we're here in Panama City. Uh, there is Adventures in Marriage, which is a program uh, done by Live the Life Ministries, but also our diocese partners with them. Local parishes here, St. John, St. Dominic, uh, St. Bernadette now, and the other places in the diocese will be doing this soon. Um, also, the Diocesan Marriage Retreat, where we met oh. each other, September 30th through October 2nd. Um, can't can't speak highly enough of that. That awesome. was yes. a wonder, wonderful weekend. Yeah. Looking and forward to it. It's definitely a space <laughs> where if you're like, we need a time to go and have bigger conversations, you get plenty of time to do that. So, um yeah, pdiocese.org slash marriage enrichment. Um, do we need to plug anything else? Well, we actually yeah. did Adventures in Marriage as yeah. well. I mean, it was so fantastic. Yeah. So I, I adventure in marriage dot or, adventures in marriage dot org, and that we – why do you look quizzical? I'm not. Oh, you're like, did we do that? <laughs> we did it. And, there's- and it was, it's so fantastic. It's I think it, it's just a place to, to fall in love with your marriage again yeah. and just learn communication, mm-hmm. just little stuff. Tidbits. I really wish it was done with Precana yeah. to give you just communication tips and to get to know each other, your personality type. And it, it's really fantastic. And we, we love the retreats too. 
I'll talk to the marriage and family life director about yes, involving them in pre So yeah. <laughs> um, Well, guys, thanks so much for hanging around. We hope this uh, conversation was fruitful, beneficial for you guys. Um, please come back in two weeks where Bishop Block will continue his uh, series on the scriptures, and he's going to be diving into the Old Testament's wisdom literature. So Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, all these famous uh books of the Old Testament, which a lot of amazing wisdom and tidbits and stuff, you'll be breaking that open. So we'll see you back then. Thank you for tuning in today to the Gaudium et Spes podcast. If you would like to know more about our podcast, please visit gaudiumetspes.net or go to ptdiocese.org and click the button that says podcast. If you listen to the audio version from an app such as iTunes, Stitcher, or Spotify, be sure and rate, review, and comment. If you watched us on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe or leave us a comment there as well. Thank you for joining us.